All we want is a dialogue. Yeah, look, at yeah. look at that! Look at that shit! Love is why we're alive on this planet to thrive, not merely survive and get by. Losing our minds as we try to find the meaning of our being. Just love. Love, keep it simple. Hi, I'm Scott McGee, and I'm on this episode, Live Through Love, with my boy Ruben Rojas. And on this episode, we talk about law enforcement, living through love, and the power of forgiveness, gratitude, and all. What's up, Scott? Thanks for coming into the studio today. Thank you. Thank you. It's beautiful here. I absolutely love it. Pun intended. Yeah, right? I like how you kind of cruise by sometimes, make sure it's being protected. Well, and, dude, I'm protective of your stuff yeah. and, and your message and your art. You know that I've cared about you for a long time, and I'm very proud of the work you do. And um, anything I can do to help support it and protect it, I'm there for you. Well, thank you so much, brother. And for those of us that are tuning in and don't know who you are, you are a sergeant in a police department. Yep. And you've been an officer for how long now? Ooh, probably about 17 years. 17 years. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons, other than being a good friend and I love what you stand up for, we've done a lot of good community work together, but I really want to talk about policing today. It's such a tough topic. And depending on what you're tuning into, if you're turning on the TV or what station or what you're reading or what's on Twitter. But like, I really wanted to dive in. Like we we're here, we talk about live through love and we talk about love. And I want to really use that lens and have someone that's really diving into it. I've got a lot of police friends mm -hmm. and they all have different walks of life. I've seen them change over time from really sweet humans to really more darker people because they see kind of the worst in people. But what I've always seen in you is you, you're the light and you hold the light and you walk lighter and you really believe in humanity. So, you know, I just want to kick it off to you and I really want to learn what it's like to be you today. Well, thank you for that. I do want to point out, though, that I wasn't always as light as you put it mm -hmm. at, um, throughout my career. There was a there was a time in my career where. I was certainly um, shorter with people. I started to get more cynical mm. and started going down that that path. And then some things happened and I was able to to claw my way out of it. Mm. Now, there is, you know, law enforcement is very interesting um, in that what you see on TV and what you see on the little, I always say like little rectangle, rectangular shiny devices that everyone gets their information from, whether yeah. it's the TV or a phone or their computer or iPad is just a, it's part of the perspective. It's not the entire picture, but that is like a different world than what actually happens in real life. Mm -hmm. And, and law enforcement were, were, you know, much better at what happens in real life and not so much on the PR side of things. Yeah. Um, but to go back, there is a, a and this is a, a large discussion. 
when someone gets hired, they go through an entirely like lengthy process. Law enforcement tends to pick out the like the best of the community. Mm. Let's just say in your community, you have 300 people that apply. Maybe one of them will make it. Mm. And that person goes through you know, a written exam, physical, like a physical fitness exam. Um, there's a, a background investigation. There's a psych test. There's an oral panel interview that they have to go through. There's a chief's interview mm. and the background investigators will you know, comb through your life. They go talk to your college roommates and girl, ex-girlfriends. It's pretty extensive. Yeah. And there's more meetings. Um, you know, you take these, I remember we used to, like these 500 uh, question exams to see if I was like mentally fit for mm. the job. Like, are you afraid of bees or spiders? <laughs> Yeah. But by the time you go to 100 of those questions, you may not, I'd be like, I'm going cuckoo. What am I reading here? 500 yeah, no, questions. Yeah. And I'm sure there's science to it. But yeah. the point of it is there's a system that you get through it. And it, it's a stressful system. And this is going to be a theme here. Then when you get finally get hired, it's like, awesome, sweet. And then you get put into a high stress academy. And the academy, like, again, you're taking the best of the community and you're throwing them into a high stress situation. Mm. There's, and that's on purpose. You have to get some stress inoculation, see how people respond to that. Yeah. And then there you have to like, no speeches. You have to make sure your buttons are straight. You have to like march in step. You have to know all these codes and test and spelling. And if you misspell on your test, you know, the academy that I went to, you to wear this little spelling book around your neck. <laughs> uh, if you were um, even, a, um, I don't remember if it was a certain BMI or a certain body weight. They would start checking your lunches to making sure you're eating healthy mm. and the whole, and then you have homework and you have to be on time. And then if you messed up during the day, you got to write. I remember there would be at some point in time, you had to like write about eight papers a night. And if you messed up one letter, it was all like block writing. You had to start the entire thing over. There can't be any mistakes on it. Oh, wow. It was just stressful. Stress. So you're cracking, you're cranking them up. Academy. And then you have your personal life stuff going on. And then after that, you go to the, you go to the um, your agency, and then you got to figure out like how do you talk to people. There's a weird culture situation here. Where do I stand? Like, what am I? Where am I supposed to go? Where's my locker? How do I wear stuff? And again, you're getting cranked up, and then you get into a field training program, and then you have um, you know a senior officer that's there to train you because you're your field training officer, and then. You have to know all the radio codes that are coming out of the radio. You have to know your orientation of your city. You have to know where everybody is. You have to understand how to drive, how to work the little computer, which looks like at first, um, I don't know if you've seen it, but it looks like reading the matrix. Yeah. I remember when I first looked at it, I was like, felt like I was trying to read the matrix and I didn't know how to do it yet. Wow. And then you have somebody there grading you and scoring you on everything and your job depends on it. So you're getting cranked up some more. So then you have that human being best out of the community. And you have them and they've been on this cranked up stress situation before they're even exposed to the worst parts of human behavior. Mm. Day in, day and night, week after week, month after month, year after year. And so then that person, again, you take the best out of the community, they're stressed up, stressed, they're in the, the sympathetic state of the autonomic nervous system, you know. If it comes up parasympathetic and sympathetic, parasympathetic for your listeners, they don't know. It's like the rest, relax, stay, mm -hmm. sympathetic, fight, flight, freeze. So we get into this hypervigilant, like raised, high, high alert state. Cortisol just streaming. Just a mess. Adrenaline, always on fatigue. Yeah, always yeah. up. They're always up. Like even driving in, you know, driving or even walking around in an area that uh, an officer patrols in, they're already up. Mm. Versus if they were to walk the same area in their in their like like our clothes, plain clothes, like yeah. plain clothes, they're a little bit more downshifted. Just because it's the high alert, you know, you've seen people just run up on officers and shoot them in the head. Damn. At red lights, I mean, eating lunch, that's all in our heads. So we're constantly like aware. So straight, right, you know, you're raised up. Now, that's before dealing with the you know the 14 year old that just committed suicide. Mm. Um, the, 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 the girl that sliced her wrist in the bathtub and then an officer will go and try and pull her out 
and she's been in the bathtub so long her like skin moves off mm. her bone the hangings from like closets like I, i'll never look at a, a ceiling fan a shower head a closet again like the same again because we see these things and it changes it's going to have an effect on a human yeah. being or the death notification that death notifications that these folks have to do um all the child stuff is bad child death the uh, sudden infant death syndrome mm -hmm. um the sexual abuse but all the kids stuff is really bad and all this stuff has a toll takes a toll on a human being and again we're talking about the best of us so over time that has a biological consequence on a human being mm -hmm. and and part of the pickle there we don't have we don't train ourselves for that we train in how to use our firearms how to how to like you know some arrest and control stuff or driving uh, you know verbal judo domestic violence stuff but only now is the is the profession really waking up to the importance of wellness and how that resonates with the human being's ability to really show who they actually are. So the people that we see out the officers like like they are doing a, the job that like the community doesn't so the community doesn't have to do. Yeah. You know, like there the really bad stuff happens. And there's always somebody that's going to show up and help in that situation. And for the most part, that's law enforcement and, and the fire department. And then to me, that's like that. That's the thin blue line, because then you're shielding the community from the, like the suffering and trauma of whatever that incident is. Mm. But eventually, over time, like the hundreds of critical incidents that officers go through has a toll. Without the proper training. A normal person will go through what, like two to four critical incidents in their life. Yeah, Maybe. if that, if that, yeah, and like two to four is like a that's like a almost a normal day for for a lot of officers, depending on on the on the area they work. So it's it is a it's a tremendously um, amazing uh, profession that we need really good people to do, and the humans that do that. They can't do it if they didn't live through love. Yeah. And that's a big, that's a big undercurrent. Like I'm going to go outside and Hey, uh, you know, I'm on a job that I have to put this vest on in case somebody shoots me today. Yeah. You're choosing. And then I'm going to put this firearm over here on my waist and I've got to be, I want it at this particular height so I can get to it quick. And I want a knife over here in case somebody attacks me and they injure me and they're going for my gun. I need to be able to, and then that's just how I get dressed for work. And not just me, but like any officer that goes in, in, yeah. in the field, you know, all the, all the amazing heroes that are doing that. That's weird. It's weird. If you think about it, that's kind of strange. What's also strange about that is it's because if we look back hundreds of years, right, humanity as a whole, there is less death. We live longer. And what I mean is back in the day, a Viking comes, takes a sword and whack or, or, or anyone in general. Mm -hmm. And that's not a, a thing against Vikings in general. It's just, I love the Viking show. So it came to mind, but in the past is like, you stole my cattle, boom, you're dead. Or that's my land. Boom. You're dead. Now that doesn't happen because there's people like you going out to set a standard and a precedent, but you've got to now arm yourself because you don't know what's going to happen. If I could carry a sword, I would. <laughs> I would. I'm not a gun guy at all. It's a tool. Um, I know how to use it. But like a four-year-old could pick up a gun and fire it and, and injure yeah. somebody. Um, a sword, that takes, you know, some skill and strength and decision-making. and Yeah. Practice. And it, it's yeah, a lot of practice. Yeah. 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 Yep. But I tell you, man, there's a lot of, a lot of guys and, and girls out there like as we're recording this right now, that are just risking their own, um, you know, safety, their on their own like mm -hmm. um, health, the health of their family because of COVID, going out there and responding to all this stuff. And you know, the media doesn't necessarily pay attention or give credit where credit is due to that particular part. Yeah, but the TV isn't where the um, the kudos that come from. 
it's the actual people that are calling for help. You know, you know, th- those are the ones that are, um, you know, hopefully have gratitude, but it's not the gratitude that gets officers to do what they do. Yeah. It's, it's love, man. It's, it's love for their partners. It's love for really it's love for, uh, for victims. Mm. Uh, you want to get officers going, like you start injuring, you create, start creating victims out of people. And you're going to see like claws and things come out of, yeah. of the good people that want to respond to that. Yeah. There's a strength and a resilience that comes to being in service. And there's multiple ways to define being in service. But when people volunteer to go to the military to protect their country, like people are volunteering to go become police officers and firemen and epide- uh, paramedics and, and all these things. And, you know, it's real easy to say, well, yeah, but they're getting paid. But are they getting paid enough? Would you do that for that paycheck? That's not their first choice of why they do that, right? You do it because you just said, we don't like seeing victims or we know we're stronger than these people and we can show up strong for them because they can't or who else is going to do it? Yep. You know, I, I tell people like on, on, you know, your wife's worst day or, or your mom's like, what kind of person do you want responding to that? Yeah. And that's also what I, we talk about uh, in, in conversations in law enforcement is that's something to remember for, for, for us as well. Because sometimes you just go from call to call to call and like, like tens of thousands of calls over time. It is a, it's like you have to make a deliberate reminder to like make sure, hey, this is, this might be the only time this person is calling 911. Yeah. And how you behave and act is going to make an impact on their life, good or bad, for the remainder of it. Yeah. Well, I think that's a tremendous opportunity. I mean, I've never called 911. Well, hopefully you don't have to. So, you know, and I don't want to, but yeah. there's a lot of people. I mean, my brother's a fireman. He's like, there's people that call 911 every single day. Yes. Yeah. And one of the things you just said, though, like, what's the officer you want showing up to your wife? But as an officer, that probably crosses your mind is who is the officer in case I'm not around and who is going to show up to my wife and kids? Mm-hmm. And you're leading by example, saying, okay, if more officers are like me, then we're in a good place. Well, no, no, no. I... <laughs> Man, there are there are so many people out there doing the job like far better than than I can. There are some amazing humans out there that that I'm striving to learn and continue to grow to be like. And you know, when when my mom was alive, um, she was living in the city that that I worked in, and she was ill and having some issues. And several times, um, you know my own agency had to respond to her apartment at the time. I even had like little security cameras so I could make sure she was safe and mm-hmm. doing okay. She has some medical issues. And, um, my first reaction was like, okay, who's going? And then once I found out who was going, I was like, ah, oh, okay, I'm good. Yeah. We're good. Like, and those guys are like, I'm to this day, I owe them like such a high level of gratitude mm-hmm. because they, they were so kind and so empathetic. And they helped her, they cleaned her up, helped her eat, like amazing stuff, amazing stuff. That really, like, had they not shown up or had any of that happen, she probably would have died that night. Mm. But like, you know, you, that happens all the time. Yeah. All the time. But again, that's not something you see on the shiny rectangles. Yeah, we don't get to experience that. As the general public, we're just shown there was another shooting. Mm-hmm. And then they show one way of making it so that it goes viral. And then if you are a citizen that actually wants to do the research and like, let's hear the facts, let's hear the whole story. You can dig in and be like, okay, officer involved shooting. This is what happened. I get that. It's, but the headlines like cop killed black man. And then everyone goes crazy all about it. Like, you know, it's like, I would love, I don't know how we can change the media. Well, I, I think you can't change how other people behave, mm-hmm. but you can change how you look at something. And if you're critical, even the language that goes into the headlines, um, I've been working where the media has called to inquire about something 
and it hasn't fit whatever narrative they're looking for and they just hang up mm. because of potentially what you know you can put two and two together here but it didn't match what they were looking for so they didn't oh, hang up and then so they're looking for something in order to like all the stuff you see is a fraction of what actually happens yeah but you have to I, I say hey why are you why do you know about that because somebody is deciding what to tell you. Mm. Just a thought. You know what? It's about money. <laughs> What's going to sell you headlines? Know. What's going to sell papers? What's going to move someone's agenda? Right? There's everyone's got agendas. And what do these agendas look like? Yeah, I mean and, that part. Again, what that? There's no, there's no excuse like for. Um, excessive force or uh bad behavior or certainly like racism all of that stuff there's no place for it and there's so i'm certain like i will never defend that but i might like no matter what happens i'll critically look at something yeah and try and seek understanding because you know all of us regardless you might have a perfect career or, you know, perfect life. And then like, there's one moment you mess up one. Yeah. And then it gets rid of the 4,000 other days that you did perfect. Yeah. So, and I, and I, and I say that also towards the, the, the people that will commit crime. Um, there's a thing called your ACE score. I think it's acute childhood experiences. Mm -hmm. And there's an actual, if, if, if anyone wants to go and check it out online, you can go and take a test and then you get a score and that score, it's obviously not a perfect science here, but that score kind of gives you, shows you like what you're kind of like pre-exposed to potentially becoming. Like if you were like had sexual abuse as a kid or, or there was narcotic use when, when your mom was pregnant with you, uh, if, if I don't remember, like if you didn't play youth sports or all these questions. And you get a certain score and then so a lot of people that we happen to come across in law enforcement they might have their ace score could be so high that it kind of exposes them to uh making poor decisions mm. and if you go back and like dang like this guy here that just did a residential burglary this is again a moment in time but let's look back and again he potentially was abused as a kid grew up on the floor never played sports uh, dad left, uncle was an alcoholic. The first group that he ever felt included in was a gang. Mm -hmm. And then the gang starts like, they have their own you know, mental control techniques that they use on, on their young ones. Yeah. And so that could have been the time where he's trying to prove himself for the gang. And then it comes across law enforcement. And am I going to define that guy as, uh, like, this is who he is in life? Or you can choose to look and be like, this action could be a consequence of what happened in the past. Mm. And again, this is, it takes some awareness. It's another moment to live through love and try to show some love. It doesn't, obviously doesn't get rid of the consequences, yeah. but it might change how you treat this person. And then that person might be recoverable. Mm. Just needs a little bit of love. Yeah. So I did this project where I painted a mural inside a Lancaster prison. When we painted right on their cell block walls and all the men that I worked with mm -hmm. had committed the worst crime. They took a life and they were in there from 35 years all the way to like eight and everything in between all different ages. People are like, yeah, I've been in here since 17, since 18, since. And I, I got to meet them. I got to tour the hospital, not, not the hospital, the, the prison and have these conversations. And when I was there, we got so deep into conversation around love and forgiveness and all this. And if I went in there close-minded, like a lot of people I know, like, wait, you're going in there, these are murderers. But what led them to that point? One guy was wrong place, wrong time, just happened to be in the area way back then, and he just got caught. <laughs> and I'm like, that's kind of one of the worst stories I've ever heard in my life. Like, he had nothing to do with it. He was just there. Other people were like, this is all I thought I had. Like my gang was the only family that ever showed me 
Um, the situation I was in led to this, um, you know, whatever. They didn't see another way out or another choice. But ultimately, after we talked about all that, I asked the question, can humans be, are they able to change or are they defined by their actions and forever? And we talked about forgiveness. And then we talked about how you have to forgive you before you even ask someone to forgive someone. So a lot of the men, I forgave me. I couldn't go ask the, the victims to forgive me. I had to forgive myself first. And I just learned so much in that experience and the letters they wrote me after. The mural's still up. It says forgiven, forgiven. But that, that right there really resonated with what you just said because sometimes we make one mistake. I've made a mistake before, mm -hmm. right? I've gotten a DUI in 2009. I got a DUI. I don't talk about it very often. And it was crazy because we don't have to go into the details. I wasn't drunk. But I got in trouble. It didn't matter. And it was their word against my word. My track history was like I was a good kid. I didn't have any issues. But it doesn't matter. I got in trouble. And that spiraled into this, this and that, a lot of fines and wherever that went to. But did that define me or who I was? Or it was one mistake I made at one point that I've come out from, obviously. And now with Uber, there's just no excuse. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. never happened again. But yeah. people um, are still and haven't learned that yet. Yeah. But let me go back. I want to talk about forgiveness, so don't, don't let me forget to come back to this point. But there is a strength in that mental like process that you just described. Like, well, something will happen. We can choose to accept it or resent it. If you choose resenting it, which we all sometimes we do, we don't we're not aware of it, then that leads us to like pain and suffering. But if we choose to accept it. Then that kind of puts you back in the driver's seat and that gives you the chance to focus on the lesson so that you can grow or if you choose to focus on the pain you stay uh, you suffer mm -hmm. but understanding that you can choose those two paths like multiple times throughout your day and overall like uh, is like such a powerful life lesson um and i'll tie back in tie it into Forgiveness. I remember the story. I remember seeing you post about it and stuff, and that made an impact on me. And I don't know if you remember, but I'm like, hey, if you go again, like, take mm -hmm. me with you. Like, I'm in like active duty, but like, I still think that would be a really cool conversation. Yeah. Um, and forgiveness is especially self forgiveness. You know, we 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 tend to like, and I'll paraphrase Marcus Reyes here, but he was talking about how we love ourselves more than we love other people on average, unless you have a kid and then you probably don't. But we care about the opinion of others more than we do about the opinion of ourselves. Um, but realizing that how powerful forgiveness is, that's like a word that I think is probably more powerful than gratitude, if I were to rank like awe and forgiveness. Love is obviously like the biggest one. But if we, if we don't, for, learn to forgive ourselves, which takes some practice. Mm -hmm. Forgive moments, not or events, not because some of those aren't always tied to people. Uh, and then learn to learn to forgive somebody that wasn't even sorry. Mm. That's another big one. But what did uh, uh, I think uh, Martin Luther King? He said, "If you lack the power of forgiveness, you lack the power of love." Mm -hmm. It's, I think it's one of the ultimate acts of self-love. I mean, taking it back to Marcus and Stoic philosophy and all that, you know, we and the perception of like we love what people think of us. How are we going to look? How are we going to be received? Which is in my early 20s when I was making a lot of money in real estate. I had big rims on my car. I had a diamond watch. Like, I didn't know about all these other things. I was like, this country says I need to show that I'm successful by the things that I have. And then how people react to that is how we get validated. But did I truly love myself? And we're not talking about egoic and narcissistic type love. We're talking about just being kind to yourself, having a conversation of compassion with yourself and being empathetic to what you're feeling instead yeah. of walling it off. All right. I think you end up, and we all arrive, some people never arrive at this conclusion here or figure it out. But you figure out that like inner peace is the actual success. It's not, not really the bank account money. That's all digital ones and zeros mm -hmm. and somewhere. 
or it's certainly not the size of your rims unless they were 26 or bigger of course inner piece is the is the real success because mm. you can have a, you can be rich and have all kinds of ones and zeros in your bank account and still be completely unhappy yeah which we see a lot of yeah depression and and obviously potential um social isolation um divorce uh all this stuff is like an on, on the undercurrent of the most happy outwardly happy looking people mm -hmm. but if you find someone that's like happy and content and have inner peace like to me that's you're rich you have arrived congratulations top level of yeah, life some of these monks right yeah yeah it's i mean i find moments of peace but even with what i'm doing like i'm constantly go 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 we got to provide for the family there's there's things all working toward that but yeah that ultimate like zen moment or was it nirvana and meditation mm -hmm. and really finding that that yeah that'd be magical and being able to just lean into it a little bit more i think you probably have it more often than you know because in order to regulate your emotions you have to stabilize your attention yeah and stabilizing your attention could be done a lot of different ways it could be playing a um a musical instrument uh through breath work through yoga meditation but also in art mm. like when you're doing your work and you're and you're you know you're in the pro right now you could probably do it like without even looking and everything but when you're in the process of writing love are you are, are you anywhere else no I'm, I'm right in the zone i'm right there that's what i mean so all your artwork is in in a way micro meditations you know, when I've had people volunteer on murals before and projects, they'll go, they'll be out there for eight hours. They'll be like, wow, this was hard, but it was the most amazing thing ever. I didn't check my phone. I didn't think about what was or wasn't happening through it. Mm -hmm. I was just right here painting this. At first, I was nervous that I would like mess up. But, but once I got into it, I'm like, yeah, that, that's a beautiful thing when you're able to do that. And I could also tell when I'm doing something and I'm just preoccupied. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to have to start over. I wasn't really happy yep. with that. Because you're, you're, you're stabilizing your attention, which is helping regulate your emotions. Mm -hmm. And I learned that big time on that, that, the big old painting that I did mm -hmm. or my big old heart. Yeah, man. I was like that thing doing that piece of art changed me forever. That one piece, that was it. That one six by three canvas, uh, you know, layered little heart that I did Yeah, taught me a massive lesson. And then that helped me um, figure out some more stuff about my attention and helping deal with, you know, some of the stuff that, you know, I've been exposed to at work and then getting and then starting to play the ukulele. Those things are all like amazing little tools to help cope with the, the, the resistance that life is always throwing at you. But again, you can't control that, but you can control how you respond to it. Yeah. And having a lot of healthy outlets to do that. Yeah. I mean, I remember you reaching out about it, like, yeah, I'm going to do this. I'm like, do it. Then you're reaching out after the fact and how much you enjoyed it. And you showed me the finished product and it was really good. It was amazing. You're like, I'm going to do this. It was this photo that you always had. Yeah. And you made the painting of it. Yep. But t talking about responding, these past couple of years with the pandemic, there's been a lot of strife and negativity and fear. And yeah, I mean, humans were in chaos it was a pandemic like these things are not to be taken lightly and they're going to keep us in fight or flight and cortisol through the roof and we don't know what's going to happen and you know we had protests and riots on different topics like we don't really get specific just realizing like people were wanting to express themselves wanting to voice something which led to political and civil unrest and things like that and what i'm getting to is that it was this moment that was caught on social media and it was you in full tactical gear looking like a just you know universal soldier and you de-escalated a situation and hugged a person on the street and i remember sharing that on social media and i wrote a caption and i was i was praising you you, you showed up in this in a way that impacted me and i'm like this is how more officers get to show up in this world and the the messaging that i got some people are like thank you for sharing this room and some people are like how dare you you're getting paid for this like this is you being part of the propaganda all kinds of expletives and everything else and in between and you know that moment to me and, and then we'll share it 
was just something that spoke into the work that you're doing out there. Like, how often do we see that? But I really want to, what was going through your head in that moment? So the, there was some civil unrest that had just started. And this was, you know, uh, a week or two after the death of George Floyd. In fact, it might have been a week. Um, and the protests read, led to some riots and some civil unrest and vandalism and some looting. And then there was all kinds of feeling that it was going to continue to happen the next day. Um, I go home. I'm at home and I start to see what's going on and gear up and respond. I remember getting there and just throwing on all my gear and um, just go, going out as fast as I could mm -hmm. to help uh, help out my city and my partners. Because you, you could hear the stuff on the radio of just like throughout the day, you could hear like someone just got stabbed. There's shootings happening. There's structure fires. There's lootings. And this was just nonstop, which is hard, especially coming like that happening in like the city that um, you grew up in. Mm -hmm. And having this and having it, I always felt like I was like, man, there's like this. There's uh, we, there's a shared humanity here that we're missing. Mm. And because we are not really communicating well with each other. And, and law enforcement in general is not that good at communicating why we do things. Yeah. Or um, really ex explaining when we make a mistake. There's, I mean, that happens in the medical field. Um, happens in dentistry. You know, it's like happens wherever there's human beings, there's going to be mistakes. Yeah. Some more egregious than others. But anyway, so this goes and there's uh, tons of protests everywhere. Um, at that particular time, there's a protest uh, south of me that grew and that grew into uh, some dispersal orders. And then uh, some tools were being used at that time, like less lethal tools. And I think some some like uh, crowd management, tear gas type things. I was not there on that side. I was on the other side. And there's a, a group gathering there. And initially, I'd respond to the other side because we didn't want our cars to be damaged and taken over, which we had seen the day before. And in these particular cars, there's a whole, all kinds of stuff in there that we did not want, did not want uh, taken. So I went to the other side. Anyways, the group started building up. And it got so big. I remember one point, they're like, you want us to box you in? Fine, we're going to box you in. Like hundreds of people. And I remember looking, just looking back, but. Yep, we're boxed in. Mm -hmm. But then I'm like, uh, like, don't change it other than that. I, I, we don't want to fight. Yeah, you know, this is. Or are we just going to start punching each other? Like, this is not something that at least I was not interested in at all. And so as the crowd grew and grew and grew, it started feeling like to the point where um, it was going to go that way. And what you saw on video, I was in um, all of my SWAT gear and had my helmet. I had my gas mask on because I was going back and forth on the other side. Mm -hmm. I had it also on because of COVID and I was around hundreds of people mm -hmm. and covered in head to toe in my uniform. And the other person that was leading that group that was about like, you know, as you see, like five to seven yards in front of us mm -hmm. was somebody I knew. Not only did I know, but that guy, I grew up in an apartment building and the neighbors uh, next to us had been in that apartment building since the sixties, like my family had mm -hmm. right next door. And that was their grandson. And so he was also my mom's caretaker. Mm -hmm. He used to take care of my mom on her worst days, multiple times, three in the morning. He checked on her. He fed her cats. Like he just was an amazing soul. And I really, owed, like when I saw him, it was an immediate like, oh, we can fix this. Mm. And so I immediately like just walked, was like drawn to him. There was no like tactical planning going on at that point. Yeah. It wasn't like, oh, okay, uh, you know, let me notify command what's going on. Let me notify my team. It was just like, it was just a dr draw. And then you could see me uh, tapping him and I was telling him to, um, to look at me and look in my eyes. And tell him, say, hey, look, it's me. It's Scott. Look at me. Look at me. Because he was really angry. Yeah. Look at me. 
And once you can see in there, once he once he does, because he couldn't recognize me. And once he did, that's when like some of the air came out and we hugged. Mm-hmm. Um, I had no idea about the cameras, no clue, like no clue. That was not at all like on my radar whatsoever. And so once I gave him a hug, that's when like all of a sudden it was like an air, an air coming out of a balloon that was about to pop. It was just, and the whole crowd dynamic changed. Um, and then we were actually able to talk. I was able to explain to them, hey, um, we got a shooting going on right now. Someone just got stabbed around the corner here. Uh, there's a structure fire at Vans. Vans is getting looted right now. I was like, you guys have us all blocked in. We can't, we can't like move our, our resources out mm-hmm. to go help people. And once I ex- explained that to them, they're like, oh my gosh, okay. I was like, can you guys... Can I get you guys to just move out of the street? Like, come on, come over here. Like, can you just, and they're like, cool. And then they eventually did. Um, and that whole thing happened without any single physical use of force on that side. And I tell people, I was like, hey, you know, I'm armed with more than just like yeah. my weapons here. You have to like to be, to really be like to effective, you have to be able to have a lot of different types of tools. And at that moment, love was my most effective tool. Mm. It was a moment of pure humanity that Mm. cut through all the noise that then permeated into everybody. Yeah. Yeah. After that, it was, man, that was surreal. Uh, I didn't, again, didn't think about it. Didn't mean, even mean for that to happen. They started chanting my name, which was kind of strange because I was like, how do you even see me? Literally like not, you couldn't see one piece of my skin other than through my, like the, the goggles. But I feel like, yeah. like, <laughs> like it's right, it's right here. here. Yeah. Um, but they are great. And I still have relationships with some of those folks. And there's moments like this that happen around the country, right? In Flint, Michigan, it's happened in different places where people could stand up and look at another human and connect beyond the uniform or beyond the outfit that's being worn on the other side as well, right? Some people are dressed a certain way. It just instigates something, even though... We, we don't want to think that we think that way, but we do. We do. Mm-hmm. So, you know, all that time period raised another conversation. And I think, and I've done some research here and there, and I think it's such a buzzword. Um, I mean, you hear it in speeches going back and forth. Defund the police. What does that really mean? And let's just dive into that a little bit. Well, all these, all, everything I'm saying about law enforcement, I have to be kind of careful there because I don't speak for all of law enforcement. There's like a million. Yeah. And, and how agencies in a different state run are totally different. We share the title of our profession, but policies and training is a lot different. So depending where you're listening, um, I'm just speaking from my personal experience. But we are a reflection of the community. We are the community. <laughs> like. We don't, I don't just go to sleep at the station in my gear and turn off and then wake up and just yeah. go right back to work. I am here to do policing. You know, no. Yeah. I go change out and I go back to my life and I'm in traffic like everybody else and I go coach Little League and, you know. Um, but I ask, like, it kind of goes like, what do you want your police department to look like? What kind of services do you want to have? Do you want, when you or your mom or your sister or someone calls 911, how quickly do you want officers to respond? Because when it comes to defunding, like, what does that actually mean? Mm. And it has to reflect what you expect out of your police department. Um, I've heard, uh, you know, there's, there's like, do you, does that, because most police departments budgets are over 90% salary and benefits. Mm-hmm. The other part is like supplies, like vehicles and equipment and pens and papers and so really, you almost have to identify, like, what is it you want cut? Because I remember my agency, they were talking about cutting a certain amount. And the chief was like, okay, that means 30 police officers. And just so you know, this is what it's going to look like if mm. you take away 30 first responders from your community. Yeah, the ramifications. And how are they going to feel knowing that their response time is less because of this? And usually it's like, oh, well, uh, and it's like, is that what you want? And then when it comes to... Say your name. That's what you want. 
because again, like we don't make all the rules, you know, so we reflect what the community wants. Yeah. So if that's what is, is chosen and sweet, um, we're not here to impose our will. We're here to, to work with the community. Uh, again, like the laws, people think like we make up the laws. Like we have nothing to do with it. They get to follow them just like everybody else. Yep. We don't, we don't even like, even the consequences for breaking them. That's not a law enforcement or a police department function. We're pretty much like hall bosses. <laughs> if we take people to go see the principal. That's yeah. pretty, and the principal decides what's going to happen. But yeah, man, the funding thing is an interesting topic and it changes depending because everyone's department has their own funding, mm -hmm. their own budget. Um, From what I hear, some of the buzz stuff is weapons, the gear. Um, or some people are like defund as in like no police ever. I mean, you get a self-police. That's a whole nother ball. Yeah, that, right? that's proven to be not really the way to go. Yeah. You yeah. know. Um, even the areas that are against weapons, say we do ourselves, then you have an armed militia yeah. with a command staff. It's like, well, wait a minute. But uh, the, and even with weapons though, the bad guy, it's funny because they're like, well, let's take all the guns away. The bad guys are going to have guns no matter what. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, let's make sure it's not automatic weapons. Well, the bad guys have the big, bad automatic weapons. doesn't matter. The bad guys always have something bigger and badder because it's illegal and they're already doing illegal things. Yeah. I mean, it's, Murder is illegal. Yeah. That still happens. Yeah. Stop signs. You're supposed to stop. If you live in LA, <laughs> go watch the stop sign. Before you have a stop sign, you have to stop before the line, before the limit line on, on a, and tell me like how long it takes before you see somebody actually do that. And that's a big old sign staring at the face right there. It's the California rolling stop. Yeah. But it's, that is a, that's you broke the law exactly like if you roll even if you stop five feet in front of the limit line completely technically you still broke the law so laws are funny like laws are just floating things and ideas and stuff on paper unless there's a consequence for it yeah the consequences and if they don't apply to you that's what some people operate yeah. like they just don't apply to me but there are some things so if i were like you know to make some suggestions or, or predictions on where uh the future of I don't say law enforcement because law enforcement is kind of a weird word. It's a limiting term. Like we are enforcing the law and that's not yeah. always what we do. In fact, a lot of times we're just going somewhere and applying common sense, whereas there isn't any at that moment or bringing people down. So they're, they become emotionally sober. But one, I could see law enforcement down the line becoming more into um, multidisciplinary teams where it's like law enforcement partnered with um, Department of Mental Health. Because the civilian role, you know, there's still a risk for them to go into an unknown situation. But partnered with law enforcement, I could see that becoming like even some, uh, uh, you know, healthcare providers as well, some nurses, uh, some people that, that, that can help out with referrals for mental health. And then, of course, law enforcement, because partially because law enforcement has the ability to legally detain somebody mm -hmm. not everybody has that um that and then and then a program uh, you know we've we've tested this before but a program where you take somebody um they just did something in the world that now they need a, a, an adult timeout so you, we take them into a cell and again right there depending on what happened with them it goes back to what we were talking about earlier, looking into their history. Well, having somebody there, like a social worker or another type of a DMH worker that can follow up with that person, mm -hmm. like, hey, what's going on? And you find out that they did the crime because of, you know, you know, mom's at home and she's a heroin addict and she's trying to, like, get money for her little brother. Mm -hmm. I don't know. There's all kinds of reasons why people do things. But in there, a lot of people think they're doing something right. They're, you know, most people do actions because they feel that in that it's serving some purpose for them mm. well that's where the shared humanity is but having some people within those temporary holding cells that can follow up mm. with that person in a safe environment where they're not out you know in an unpredictable environment in the field so like a secondary system that can now support the work you're already doing mm -hmm. and when they're potentially calm after the fact ask some questions like look i really need to get to know what your situation is if we start learning where people are coming from, then maybe we can start addressing the problem. 
Yeah. Because, you know, I right now, purely based on law enforcement, us just someone does a crime and then they go on adult timeout might not be the best solution for them. Mm -hmm. Like just going and sitting in a cell is not going to heal them. And to provide a way. Yeah. And it might keep them in that cycle. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. And so I think uh, moving forward, there is an opportunity for more restoration and more recovery of human beings. Mm. Not everybody, not every, every, sometimes people just need to go away for a little bit, but there are a lot of stuff out there, a lot of lower level stuff that people can benefit from a little bit of love. Yeah, more often than not. I mean, there mm -hmm. are the sociopaths and the psychopaths and no, the outliers, sure. Yeah, but there are a lot of people that just need a hand, need a hug. And mm -hmm. how do we look at that? And I say the same thing about our folks too our folks that are in the field and some of the behaviors that they make, they need to be looked at as well mm. and look back and be like, Hey, like you need some help and it's okay. Yeah. It's actually, you you're, should be completely normal based on the things that you've been through. Mm -hmm. Cause I think in, at the, you know, there is an opportunity to get pretty, um, psychologically messed up and biologically messed up that has turned anybody into making a bad decision or emotionally um, intoxicated. And I think a lot of times that's where you see on your TV is you see a human being that has been through it too much and they aren't thinking clear anymore, or they're so stressed out. Um, whatever's going on in their life, they're going, it could be going through a divorce. I don't know. All these things that come into making that exact moment that, if they probably watched on tape, they'd be like, what was I thinking? Mm. So it goes both ways here. Yeah, totally. We're, we're humans on both sides. Yeah. So thank you so much for that, Scott. Now for the question. How do you define living a life through love? There's three words that have popped into my head here. One of them is service. The other is gratitude. And the other is awe. And we've hit on the other ones like uh, forgiveness. Um, but if you live with gratitude and you live with, uh, forgiveness and you are constantly like living through the, like the power of awe, I think that puts you on the path of just seeing love everywhere you go. Mm. And there's, there's miracles all around us at any moment in time. If you have senses, the miracles are there. You can hear, you can hear all these amazing miracles. If you can see, especially colors, mm. that's amazing. Like go in nature and walk around and check out the house, how the flowers and colors are. It's yeah. like nature's art. It's absolutely amazing. Yeah. Go out on your street and actually pay attention to the plants. It's fascinating. Mm -hmm. If you can walk, like you have two healthy legs that can stand upright and create your own locomotion, that itself is a gift. Mm. It's so, funny looking at grass. Mm -hmm. You could go to 10 different lawns. They all have 10 different kinds of grass. Because sometimes you're like, oh, it's just grass. No, there's a lot of different grass. Like that, just noticing that. Yeah. Grass is amazing. What, like, I'm so grateful for the front of my house. I have St. Augustine grass. It's taken a, a beating lately because of the remodel, but the grass there. And that provides like the support for my two boys' childhood and the memories they have with that. Mm. They can fall down on it, not get hurt. They can s practice sliding. I don't know. This is all, all that you see the beauty. You can see the good. And that just really helps live a life through love. Amazing. Thank you so much. Of course, man. Proud of you. Thank you. <laughs>